I don't think we can have this discussion without giving people some understanding of what radiation is. Um, and uh, I, I, I would like us to do it in a way that's both rigorous enough that we can really get into some of the science of this, um, but also get into it gently enough right. that people that maybe don't remember high school physics well enough sure. uh, can come along for the ride and not get lost. But once we Absolutely. sort of get into grays and millisieverts and all that stuff, I want everyone to be fluent when we start talking about doses. Right, right, right. So, you know, uh, radiation itself, it, the, the term itself has kind of got a bit of a negative connotation, but basically it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So, you know, we have everything on the one in, in, uh, in the uh, range of increasing energy of, of uh, photons, which are just particles of light. On the one end, you have radio waves and microwaves. On the other end, you've got infrared and excuse me, you've got ultraviolet and then you get into x-rays and radio waves. And in the middle of all that is the visible spectrum. So when you see, I'm sure everyone's seen the graphs where you've got the rainbow, red, green, blue, that we can see the human eye can only perceive a tiny little narrow spectrum and then on the on the low end you have these radio are, waves these are wavelengths these are That's actually the, wavelengths and yep. energies which are which are uh, the very low end uh, energies you have things like radio waves and though in that in that situation both radio waves and microwaves are what they call non ionizing and i know you've talked about this on some of your previous podcasts and you had a really good one with uh, Atari Walla from uh, Pranuvo where he went to really it was really nice uh, in depth discussion but essentially the bottom line line is that the low energy stuff that is non-ionizing cannot damage tissue. And that goes all the way up to visible light. Then when you start going to the higher energy x-rays, that's when you get uh, both x-rays as well as ultraviolet light and then the, the high and then the higher particle stuff. But basically the higher you go in the energy in the in the energetics of the particles, the more likely the exposure to these uh, packets of energy are going to cause damage to your DNA. And why is it that the shorter the wavelength, because that's what's changing as you go mm -hmm. from radio waves to microwaves to visible waves to right. ultraviolet, to, why is it that as the wavelength gets shorter, the energy gets bigger? Yeah, I'm not sure what the reason is. They're just, they're, they are inversely proportional to each other. I don't know that, I guess I'm probably not enough of a physicist to answer okay. that question precisely. But having said that, that, that is the, 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 uh, uh, the characteristic of this. And in doing so, that's one of the big reasons why all the uh, uh, fallacies fallacies about your cell phone giving you brain cancer and all are just that they're they're fallacies because even having a cell phone on your on your ear for hours a day that's it's non-ionizing radiation and standing too close to a microwave oven again non-ionizing radiation so that cannot damage your cells the right. way that the, the other the radio can. wave is too long that's the, right the microwave is too long mm -hmm. it doesn't have the energy you can stand on it all you want it can heat but it can't damage. Correct. It can excite the molecules, but it won't actually eject an electron, which would, which is what would cause an ion to form, which is why it's called ionizing. And that's where we deal with on the, uh, I'm on the therapeutic end. So diagnostic radiologists deal with lower energy x-rays than we do. Uh, the very high energy x is what we use in our linear accelerators to treat cancer. Yep. So that's the big difference there is kilovoltage versus megavoltage, but all of these are ionizing. Okay. So let's talk about how these are measured. How do we quantify them? Because people on the mm -hmm. podcast have heard me talk about this, I suspect. Right. You know, we talk a lot about calcium scores and CT angiograms and PET CT. And so the, I think right. the, the, the frequent listener will have been somewhat familiar with how we talk about how to dose those things. Right. So radiation dosage, there's a couple of different terms that we talk about. The main one we talk about when we're talking about patient treatment is, is the unit called the gray. And that's an SI unit that essentially is joules of energy per kilogram of tissue. So that's what they call absorbed dose. So that's in tissue. Whereas when you're talking about exposure in the general, uh, like in the air and just in, 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 in general exposure, it's in the air. And that's, we usually use the term sievert for that. And actually both those terms for the most part are equivalent. It's just that uh, the sievert itself will take into account if you have different types of uh, uh, of, uh, of x-rays, different qualities of x-rays that have different degrees of uh, potential to be ionizing, that they have a, a quality factor you'll multiply it by. But for the most part, we use the term gray when we're talking about, for example, when I treat a prostate patient, they're going to get somewhere between 70 and 80 gray, but it's fractionated into small daily doses as to be tolerable to, for the body. And then when we talk about like millisieverts like we're going to, that's really just just a measure of exposure, not, not uh, absorbed dose in tissue per se. 
And what's the relationship between a gray and a millisievert? Is it a one to one? Yeah, relationship? so a, a gray and a sievert, technically. A lot of so the 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 gray also. If if anyone's kind of old school, you read you listen to older stuff, you heard the term rads. A lot of people yep. have heard of rads. So one rad is equal to one centigrade. Uh, one hundred rads is a gray. It's just an SI unit versus the old the older terminology. And a sievert is the equivalent, only it's in air, not in tissue. But a sievert is a gray? Correct. Correct. So when you give ni- 70 gray, right. you're giving 70 sieverts or 70,000 millisieverts over the course of the treatment? That's correct. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Um, and just so people can kind of anchor this to things that are familiar, mm-hmm. uh, living at sea level exposes us to one to two millisieverts of ionizing radiation a year. That's exactly right, Monet. And then, of course, at, at uh, altitude, it could be double that. That's actually. right. If you live in yeah. Denver, it's mm-hmm. easily double that or right. triple that, right. correct? Uh, it, and, uh, just another thing for comparison, a pilot who spends a lot of time traversing the North Pole, right, which is typically how they're going to fly. They're mm-hmm. not going to go all the way around the center of the earth. Correct. Um, might get another three or four millisieverts it's of quite radiation. A bit, quite a bit. That's right. Per per trip, actually. So that that can add up. And I was actually talking to a pilot friend about this, and uh, they don't really have any uh, uh, sort of a limitation in terms of total exposure that requires them to be to be uh, out of the to, to be taken out of the air a lot of them they're they're forced to retire at 65 i think is there's the commercial requirement but there's really they don't really monitor the uh, actual uh, exposure to that level to where they it's then i think the reason they don't really use that as a as a limiting factor for the amount of work is really just that even though they get a higher dose there's been no proven increase in cancer in those types of populations even in you know flight attendants or anything like that the same way that the people in denver and the people here in texas don't have any higher incidence of cancer now the nrc recommends that a person not be exposed to more than 50, I believe, 50 millisieverts of radiation in a year. Correct. Now, uh, someone like me, that that's easy, mm-hmm. right? Unless I'm out there getting a lot of diagnostic radiology or, right. of course, undergoing therapeutic right. radiation uh, treatment. Um, but for someone like you mm-hmm. who has to set patients up or one of your techs is that a, are you guys approaching that level of exposure? Not at all. And, and so it depends on what type of radiation we do. Now, typically for our external beam machines, we're doing it all remotely from behind a shielded wall. So the vault in which the machine is placed is custom built just to shield based on the angles that the machine can move through. If there's like a direct angle where the machine is hitting a wall, that wall has to be built 10 times thicker than the walls where the beam can't reach. So essentially our dose when treating remotely is close to zero. So we keep film badges and we've been, it's almost become kind of a joke that when we're not doing brachytherapy, which is dealing with actual live radioactive sources, our exposure is super low, almost negligible really. But back when I was in residency doing a lot of GYN implants and things like that, where you're, you're putting cesium or iridium actually into the body cavities and you're actually up there putting it in up close, we had a, a ring badge on and, and we would certainly, we, we, as a residence, we'd rotate every month, but if we didn't, re, it didn't rotate, some of the faculty actually got Got pretty high doses. And any idea what the sequelae of that was? Yeah, I, I know of a couple of folks, the ones who did a lot of GYN therapy, especially in the older days, we're talking about in the 80s and the 70s, where you could actually see dermatitis on their hands from doing that, just from the hand exposure. One of my faculty members actually had a giant cell tumor of the bone in her finger. And again, this is after decades and decades of doing it. It was a, you know, it was a benign growth, but uh, that, that was a real thing. There's a lot of uh, 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 data out there on especially people who were dealing in x-ray for dentistry and stuff like that back in the day when they didn't have shielding or anything like that, that they would get dermatitis. The most common thing you'd see is skin irritation in that sort of situation, dermatitis, and even some kind of chronic flaking and things like that. 